Goldman Sachs is rejecting Bitcoin. Are they making a massive mistake? Grayscale saw its lowest outflow day in quite a while, but the rest of the ETFs didn't really bring a lot of money in. What is going on with the Bitcoin ETFs? We're going to break that down. Also, a massive airdrop happened today. The wormhole token officially goes live. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we have a video to share with you as well. Also, Dogecoin. Is money going to start flowing back into Dogecoin? And what are some price targets that you should look out for? We have that and much, much more on today's episode of Sin City Crypto. Let's get it. Hola, hola, everyone. You get two hola's to me. I'm joined today with Forrest. We uh, kicked Robin out of here. He's on a vacation with his son. And so we asked our friend Forrest to join us. Forrest, thank you so much. It's been a while, man. I was saying this before we went on the show. Too long, man. How you been? You still, you still crushing these well. markets? Or Thanks what? for having me on. Yeah, markets are doing well. Gold and silver running. Doge looking good. Bitcoin hanging in there. Got a lot of stuff on Solana running. Did you say gold and silver? Oh, yeah. Wow. You've been hanging out with Peter. Oh, Peter Schiff. Mm. You gotta love the guy. You gotta love the guy. Love I don't know guy. about love the guy, but hey. But, uh, let's start here, Forrest. Let's start with Goldman Sachs under pressure for rejecting crypto investment asset class status for Bitcoin. So this is an article from CoinGate.com. While several major Wall Street firms have embraced cryptocurrencies, banking titan Goldman Sachs has opted for a different approach. Sharman, and no, we're not talking about the toilet paper, Mosavar Rahamni, the chief investment officer of the bank's wealth management division, has expressed a pessimistic view of the crypto sector. She said, quote, we do not think it is an investment asset class. We're not believers in crypto. I'll tell you what they're believers in is in money. Because if you remember, they were one of the, uh, the last minute applicants to become an authorized participant for, I believe it was Fidelity or BlackRock's ETF. So on the other hand, Goldman Sachs competitors in traditional finance, namely BlackRock and Fidelity, have doubled down their efforts after most clients showed interest in Bitcoin. However, Charmin stated that there's no such demand from the clients of Goldman Sachs. I don't know if I buy that. It said, she said, quote, and we'll leave it at this. If they cannot determine its worth, how can you confidently take a bullish or bearish stance? She questioned. Forrest, we get this question a lot from the normies, right? Like, well, especially people from traditional finance, traditional money, they're used to looking at, at uh, P&L sheets. They're used to looking at revenue. They're used to looking at how many employees are you hiring? What, you know, what kind of money are you raising? How, what do you say to the people that say, well, you can't really put a value on Bitcoin? How do you value Bitcoin? What does Bitcoin get its value from? Uh, wherever somebody's willing to pay for it, whatever the market's willing to pay for it. Um, I don't buy into the whole like backed by energy thing or anything like that. I think most things are just valued at whatever the market's willing to pay for it on any, at any given time. Um, at the, the, this Goldman Sachs thing, one trend that you do see is a lot of these um, TradFi institutions they they just talk their bags, right? So it's very clear that Goldman Sachs is sidelined on crypto. Um, we've seen the the 180 from you know JP Morgan. We've seen uh, no JP Morgan's still anti crypto, I believe. Morgan Stanley, um, BlackRock in the past, Larry Fink in the past have talked bad about Bitcoin and crypto, and now they're talking it up. If they see the demand for it, and now once they have a position, they will show their bags. Um, this just tells me that Goldman Sachs doesn't have a position yet. They're still sidelined. Um, so of course they, if they don't have, if they don't stand to benefit from crypto doing well, um, they're going to talk bad about it because they don't want to drive customer money or anyone's money into an asset class that they do not have a part of a share of. Um, so yeah, eventually I think they'll probably capitulate and, and, uh, take a crypto position of some sort. Um, because I think they'll be forced to, because the demand is just too high. So, Forrest, you don't think the largest public ledger that is ran by the largest decentralized kind of bundle of computers and network, you don't think that has any value? 
Uh, no, it does have value. It absolutely has value. It just has value that's equal to whatever somebody's willing to pay for it um, at any given time. So like right now we're seeing demand rise where we're going to see supply get crunched. It's just supply and demand for anything. That's how you value any asset, in my opinion. It's just strictly supply and demand. You have your supply and then whatever demand is. If demand goes up and supply remains stable or even decreases, you're going to see price go up. Um, but I don't, I don't, but I think price is a, a, a derivative of, of supply and demand strictly. Um, and you can use certain things to, to, to try to estimate demand. You know, you have stocks and equities that, that, uh, you know, demand is very largely based off of cash flows. Um, and, and in this case for Bitcoin, it's, it's just, uh, you know, demand is, is, you know, derived from a variety of different things. One of that being, you know, the, uh, the, idea of it being a store of value, um, the idea of it being a decentralized store of value. Um, but as far as like how to specifically value it on any given day, it's just supply and demand for me. No, uh, one can argue, uh, one can argue that same point to everything, right? Anything is worth what it is, right? So, uh, take a look at something like, uh, groceries. I don't know, bananas. If all of a sudden people don't want to buy bananas or don't think bananas at $4 are worth it, guess what? Uh, the price of bananas are going to come down. And so um, I don't buy into the, just like you don't buy into the narrative that Bitcoin, the price is backed by X, Y, and Z. I don't buy into the, to the opposite side of it where, where, you know, Hey, just because we can't put a fundamental analysis of, Hey, what's the profit and loss? You technically can, if you really wanted to take a look at the miners operating the network and how much revenue they're making. I think that's your best pulse to a fundamental analysis of Bitcoin as you can get. But I do think, you know, and, and that's why part, part of me when people talk about Bitcoin uses so much energy. Okay, it uses a lot of energy. But what is that energy going towards? Is it being wasted? No, it's actually more than 50% renewable. It's being used to secure the most decentralized network of computers in the world. And I think that's of value to a lot of people. Maybe not to us in the here in the U.S., but best believe it, the people in other countries and emerging economies who don't have access to bank accounts, who can't store their wealth or move their money, to them, it's extremely valuable, right? And so I guess it's all about perception. But to Forrest's point, realistically, anything in the world is worth what people are willing to pay for it. If something gets too expensive, people stop buying it. Guess what? The price of that is going to go down. I hear um, Ashley's joining us. I hear she has, some, uh, she has an apology for Jimmy. You have a... I have an apology for Jimmy. You wanted to He's apologize for, no for not seeing him? Remember, you didn't even um, sit. That see wasn't him my anything? fault. Okay, so you're going to blame me. It is your fault. Okay. Yeah. Never mind, Jimmy. I'm sorry. I thought she had an apology. For I do not have um, an apology. Okay, fair enough. Well, we're excited to have you here. I'll see. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we move on, I do want to give a big shout out to our channel sponsor, Legacy Network. Uh, Legacy is coming out with an app that's going to bridge the gap between GameFi earning money and being able to better yourself essentially. So the big one for me is gonna be time management. Their app is launching soon. You'll be able to go into the app. You'll be able to help. It's, it's like self-development uh, in different areas, whether it's business, whether it's time management, and you'll also be able to earn money doing that along the way. It's a beautifully designed app. I cannot wait for this thing to go live so you guys can check it out. If you wanna learn more about the project, join their Telegram, use the link in the description of this video. I do want to talk about flows that is from the Bitcoin ETF. This is from Farsight. So yesterday, uh, we had a net flow positive of $40.3 million. Grayscale had its lowest outflow day uh, going as back as this chart shows us, which is March 15th, right? Only $81.9 million. But uh, we also, we saw more outflows from the ARC product than we did from Grayscale. Uh, we still saw 150 million flowing into Bitcoin via the BlackRock ETF, 44.8 from Fidelity, and the rest are negligible for us. We often talk about the inflows from the ETFs. No one really talks about the outflows, right? Um, I do not buy into the fact that the people that are buying the ETF now, if they're sitting on a 3X and economic, uh, the economic landscape changes, that they're not going to move out of the ETF and into something like, I don't know, gold or United States dollars. Although I don't agree with that. Let's face it. People that want the exposure to Bitcoin because of the purpose it serves, right? The hedge against monetary debasement, the sovereignty, 
they're not doing that through an ETF because it's not your Bitcoin. They're doing it specifically to speculate on the price. And as we see here from ARK, this is not a, a uh, like a grayscale scenario where their fees are 1.5% and we expect outflows. This is just something that just the ebbs and flow of the market. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And, and what are your thoughts on, you know, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, uh, the breakdown uh, on Spotify, and they had, um, I forget his name. He's a, he's, an, he's a macro and ETF guy, but he talks about, look, you're gonna, you're, it's not just gonna be inflows forever. You're gonna see outflows. And he believes that the volatility is actually going to increase. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, and what are your thoughts on these numbers here? Uh, yeah, so the ARC B number, 87.5 million, it does seem higher than usual, but I mean, you look above there, we have seen some inflows to the tune of 200 million before. So that could just be ebbs and flows. It could be one player in particular, just taking some risk off um, from, from Bitcoin. Um, the big news and the reason for maybe you know, some speculative, excuse me, outflows for Bitcoin um, could be the go the government moving that huge chunk of Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, look, nobody really like kind of have to make a decision. Like we don't really know if the government's going to dump all of that, if there's going to be OTC sales, the cadence with which they're going to dump it. We don't know who's going to deploy and use that as an opportunity to bid Bitcoin, but it's certainly not like bullish, right, in the short term for the government to be moving a ton of Bitcoin. Um, so I think for that reason, you probably have some people taking some risk off, like, hey, let's just get back in um, once the government has sold. Uh, but yeah, like those three, four, five hundred million dollar inflow days, you know, back to back to back, that's that's like such an insane amount of money that that was just very obviously not sustainable for a long period of time. Um, for reference, in terms of like new supply hitting the market on any given day from miners, um, you know, you look at the 900 Bitcoin mined per day times, you know, the 60 and 60,000 and change price. Um, you know, you're looking at somewhere between 50 and 60 million dollars in supply um, going to miners per day. That's, you know, that's potentially offset on the by these ETF flows, um, it, you know, with a 50 or 60 million dollar day. So that 40 million net inflow is that's a solid day. That's offsetting a lot of the days, um, a lot of the days. Uh, minor outflows or, or supply, uh, essentially. Um, and again, it's just inflows versus outflow, outflows, supply versus demand. So if these ETFs just continue to drive demand, even if it's $40, $50 million a day, um, that is a big net positive win. But yeah, I think I think uh, it'll, it'll fluctuate. There will be ebbs and flows. Um, but I do expect in general for the, the flows to be uh, net positive for a time, um, you know, going into the halving and, and post-halving. So Forrest, let's yeah, say I don't know if I answered all the questions there. So let's say two years from now, okay? Let's let's fast forward to April of 2026. Do you think these swings are going to be a lot more volatile, um, or do you think they're going to be a little more stable? Uh, personally, I'm in the opinion you're still going to see. Like, I still think like the having like you kind of have that big four year cycle programmed into Bitcoin. You're going to see on the macro like big swings. I still believe like. I think we'll see really positive upside for Bitcoin. And I think we'll see a big correction. Like I, I'm not of the opinion that Bitcoin is just going to go up to 120 K and just, you know, the bear market that we get from there is going to be like a 15% correction. I still think you're going to get a big pump for Bitcoin, uh, and, you know, on a multi-month time frame, and then probably a large drawdown. I don't know if it'll be 40% this time, 50%, 60%, 70, I, I don't know. But I still think you'll have that general ebb and flow of like, you know, bull market expansionary phase and then cool down period in a bear market. Um, but from a day-to-day -day perspective, a shorter term time perspective, I do think that volatility will be a little bit more muted. I agree with James Safert and Eric Belchunas, the ETF experts, that um, because of the way that these uh, these institutions allocate and these funds allocate towards uh, towards Bitcoin and other assets, uh, you get a little bit muted volatility. Now, it doesn't mean volatility is going to go away. Bitcoin is still a volatile asset. But uh, let's just say somebody wants a 5% allocation in their portfolio to Bitcoin. Well, if Bitcoin doubles in price, all of a sudden that, that 
allocation towards Bitcoin might be at 10% compared to the rest of their portfolio. They're naturally going to sell some Bitcoin off to get back to that 5% target and vice versa. If Bitcoin's price goes down by say 50% for easy math, they're going to start bidding Bitcoin back up to that 5% allocation in their portfolio. So that creates a little bit of a, a muted volatility effect from the ETFs. Now, on the other hand, um, we are in a kind of bullish market. Everyone's you know kind of talking about Bitcoin as a store of value. We're approaching the halving. I do think that you get a lot of derivative speculation. You, know, you look at CME futures and open interest. Like I do think that will still contribute to a large amount of volatility. But as far as for the net effect that the ETFs have on Bitcoin, I think that uh, the ETFs are a, a, a positive in terms of you know muting the volatility of Bitcoin, uh, which is already you know pretty volatile in terms of of, of asset classes. Um, so yeah, I think I think. Uh, it, ETFs are, are going to mute the volatility a little bit, but I don't think that's going to lead towards low vol, vo, low vol Bitcoin. I think like Bitcoin's still going to be volatile because of all the derivative speculation on it. Yeah. You know, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to bring up the exact same, you know, reasoning as you did, as far as the percentage allocation, when it goes up, you're going to see a rebalance to the downside and then the vice versa as well. So I think the dips will get scooped up a lot faster. Um, Will we still see 70, 80% corrections? I don't know. Will we see 40 to 50? Probably. Chances are yes. Um, all right. I do want to talk about the wormhole, um, the wormhole token airdrop. By the way, did you get a allocation for us to the wormhole token? Yeah, I'm still going through all my wallets to figure out how much I got, but uh, I claimed on one wallet. I don't know. Um, I don't know how much I got on other wallets. I got a, I got like a hundred wallets to go through. So, <laughs> if you need help, let me know. I charge a small fee. I'm just kidding. Uh, I do want to <laughs> do want to share this video from the Super Team DAO. This was so good. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. We got your ether scan back, and unfortunately, we found something. What is it, Doc? You've been diagnosed with ETH maximisis. You're in ETH maxi. In ETH maxi. It's Robin. Doc, that's not possible. It's okay. He's going to take some time to process this. He can only handle 10 alphabets per second. He has been really <laughs> slow lately. Is he allergic to anything? To any wallet that isn't MetaMask. Allergic to good UI. <laughs> any difficulties while digesting? He couldn't digest the fact that Austin Federo went on bankless. <laughs> but is he going to be okay, doctor? I'm going to need to run some more tests. What do you see here, Nathan? <laughs> what are you doing? What? I'm just booking a cab with a decentralized application on Ethereum Layer 1. See? It's five minutes away. He's seeing fully functioning consumer apps and white papers. That's stage three of ETH Maximizes. What does that mean, doctor? Do you see all of this gas in his transactions? It's only a matter of time till he gets wrecked. There must be some here. We can reduce gas if we use wormhole and bring him into the Solana ecosystem. Exposure to real apps that actually work can cure him. But we must act quickly or he'll progress to stage five. What happens in stage five? That could be fatal. That's when they start a podcast. <laughs> What's happening, doctor? It's a common reaction faced by ETH Maxis. They can't function without another layer. Layer three. <laughs> layer four. Every day, millions of devs suffer from ETH Maximisis. Extend them a helping hand by guiding them to- That was so good, dude. That was probably one of the best videos I've seen. Oh my God, that was- <laughs> uh, All right. Ah, uh, that was good, wasn't it, Forrest? That was really good. Yeah, that was, that was well made. <laughs> he can't function without layers. All right, Wormhole debuts at a $3 billion valuation in 617 million token airdrop. This is from Coindesk.com. Cross-chain bridge Wormhole initiated an airdrop that will see early users rewarded with 617 million of its newly issued governance token, W. The token opened at $1.66 on Solana-based DEX OpenBook 
with a market cap of just shy of $3 billion and a fully diluted value of 16.5. Uh, Forrest, I mean, you have more experience with airdrops than I do. That's a pretty massive valuation for a brand new token, is it not? What What are your thoughts on on the wormhole token airdrop and and what what would you maybe advise? Well, not advise people. What would you maybe let people know and understand with the airdrops? What to expect? Maybe how price tends to react? What people tend to do? What the markets do when they get these tokens airdrop? Yeah, I mean, generally, like you just have a ton of supply hitting the market from um, with basically zero cost basis uh, hitting the market um, in the form of these airdrops. So a lot of people, it's like free money; they're going to sell it. Um, now you have some people that you know they are bullish on wormhole and they want to own the token. So you'll have some demand come in. You'll have some buyers come in, but it's usually hard to drum up uh, more demand than supply in the immediate aftermath of a, of an airdrop. So like. Go and look at the Jido charts. Go and look at uh, the Uniswap chart after their airdrop. Go and look at Jupiter. Like most of the time, you just get a slow bleed off as a lot of people just take their free money and sell off. And then once you hit an accumulation phase and if the project becomes undervalued or people are bullish on it, it kind of finds a floor. And then you start to see positive price action like Jupiter and, and Jido are pumping as we speak um, above their airdrop prices and making new highs. Um, but it was only after a large drawdown where the initial people that were gifted that money um, that may not have super high conviction on, on, on the protocol are starting to sell off. And then, you know, you see that sell off into an accumulation pattern um, where, you know, the people who are you know, not convicted on the protocol or the token are selling to people who do have conviction. Uh, and usually a lot of times that leads to further you know, price action to the upside. Uh, usually takes a couple of weeks or months, though. Okay. Um, all right. I do want to uh, shift the, oh, and real quick, I'm, and I apologize if you already spoke on this, but the valuation 16, fully diluted 16.5 billion. That's, that's pretty massive, right? Yeah, that's, that's high. Like too high. I mean, look, we're in a bullish market. So, you know, you can see some pretty crazy valuations be sustained for a long period of time, but like, I'm not buying much of anything out of 16 billion fully diluted valuation. I don't care what it is. Amen to that. I agree. Uh, all right, let's move on to a little bit of macro here. Um, so a million simulations, one verdict for the U S economy debt danger ahead. Uh, we are over a hundred percent as far as debt to our GDP. And once we get around that 130% is typically when these economies start to crumble or inflation starts to absolutely skyrocket. We also have this year from the Kobe AC letter, currently there is roughly $6 trillion of commercial real estate debt in the U.S. And banks hold a whopping 50% of this outstanding debt. This year, around $1 trillion or one-sixth of the debt is expected to be refinanced. Rates on these loans are set to double or even triple since they were taken. All while many of these CRE projects are going bankrupt. Can banks weather the storm? Uh, I know, Forrest, you kind of mentioned, and I'll go to this tweet here from your friend, Peter Schiff. Gold, silver, and oil have all been on a tear lately, despite the U.S. dollar holding up well against fiat currencies. Uh, talking about the dollar index being down. Um, so, Forrest, what are your thoughts? And I know you mentioned your, you know, uh, gold and silver, but but how does how does crypto, and and more specifically, I guess, Bitcoin, fair in this sort of environment potentially if you were to forecast it out yeah so um i'll try to make this simple because it, it does get kind of complex but I'm, I'm very bullish in gold and silver um a you just look at the charts the charts are screaming you know inverse head and shoulders breaking out of like multi-year uh consolidations like very very bullish on gold and silver and uh, at the same time we have yields rising well yields rising means that like bond prices are tanking right um so like u.s treasuries are basically tanking so the market is selling off u.s treasuries u.s debt in order to buy gold and silver so like what's that telling you about the faith that people have in the u.s fiscal situation moving forward uh, it's not a lot of confidence in the u.s dollar not a lot of confidence in the u.s's ability to get itself uh you know <laughs> out of out of debt or or balance the budget it'll probably never happen so <sighs> you look at like what that's that's kind of spelling for the market moving forward it's like 
people don't have a lot of faith in the U.S. dollar or and, and don't have a big interest in, in buying U.S. debt. Now, the problem with that is the Fed hasn't even cut rates yet. Uh, when the Fed, and they've signaled that they're going to cut rates, but usually when the Fed cuts rates, you see a big, big spike in long-term um, bonds, right? Long-term, but people buy up long-term bonds because they're like, oh, they're cutting rates. We're not going to be able to get these rates on long-term bonds for very long. Um, so we buy up long-term bonds. Well, what happens if people don't have a bullish long-term outlook or a safe or secure long-term outlook on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. debt situation and U.S. inflation, um, U.S. dollar inflation, they may not buy long-term bonds when the Fed cuts rates. And if they don't buy long-term bonds when the Fed cuts rates, Perfect. that is very problematic, right? Because then the, the government has to do a bond buyback program, which they've done in the past and which is very inflationary. And you get caught in the cycle of, you know, the Fed trying to suppress yields and buying back bonds. It's just, it, it becomes uh, an inflationary spiral, so to speak. So right now the market is saying, you know, we might not be the most comfortable and confident uh, in, in the economy, but risk assets and stocks and equities and crypto, um, and particularly commodities like gold and silver, is, uh, feels a lot better um, than you know being in in U.S. debt, being in U.S. Treasury. So, um, I think that gold and silver are really, really solid bets. As boring as that sounds, I know I sound like a, a an old. I'm just I just think that they're going to perform well now. Are they going to be outperformed by risk assets and crypto? Potentially, potentially. Um, but you can always lever up on gold and silver. You can just buy like call options and stuff. But now that you've got like Bitcoin, which is a, you know, over a trillion dollar asset, this is kind of in the range of where silver is at. Like I think silver is at like 1.4 trillion. It's being kind of touted as a store of value. Um, as Bitcoin catches on as a store of value, I think that gold, silver, and Bitcoin could all do well as the store of value trade. Then you've got to, you know, ask yourself, you know, what else does well if Bitcoin does well? Well, bait on Bitcoin is usually going to be, you know, altcoins, right? Basically everything else. So um, there is a scenario where if things get really rough, like maybe Bitcoin performs well and altcoins don't perform so well. But I actually um, think that altcoins will perform just as well as Bitcoin or in line with Bitcoin. Maybe not all altcoins. I think you just like have to be pretty selective about what altcoins you're in. Um, I don't think it's, you know, you can just throw a dart and, you know, hit an altcoin and uh, and perform on par with Bitcoin or outperform Bitcoin. I think you have to be a little bit more selective. Um, but I do think we are moving towards um, hyperinflation, uh, the U.S. dollar, potentially a crash in U.S. treasuries later on down the road um, if and when the Fed cuts and we don't see that nice positive flow of money into long-term bonds. Um, and yeah, I think it's just going to be a store of value trade. It's going to be uh, gold, silver, Bitcoin. Um, where can you put your money that is safe from uh, you know an inflationary spiral down the line? And that's just my theory. I could be wrong. There's lots of you know macro, macro analysts out there, lots of theories out there of how this is all going to play out. A lot of people would disagree with me, but that's just where the, you know my mindset moving forward and how I'm kind of positioning um, and, and based on what I'm expecting to play out. You know, um, we don't talk a lot of macro on the show, but I love macroeconomics. That's what I studied in college. Um, that was what I was mainly in before getting into crypto. And I think you're 100% right. And I want to paint a different picture, a more bullish picture, I guess, what I can potentially see happening. You have the younger generations, right? The, the 20 to 35, 45-year-olds who are stuck in the position. I mean, I'm 35 years old, right? And a hundred grand a year, 20 years ago, you're sitting cush, man. A hundred grand a year now, you're like, that's like 8,500 a month. My rent mortgage is 3,500. Groceries, depending on how many people you have in your home, is 1,500 to $2,000. Got to take one family vacation a year, your utilities, your phone, a car payment, car insurance. Um, you're left with what? A thousand bucks a month? If that, what are you supposed to do with that? And so I think if that scenario you just painted happens where the Fed has to come in and do a, a bond buyback, which I definitely think is, is possible, and I do agree with you, Forrest, as more countries are going away from U.S. debt and U.S. dollar, who's going to buy all these newly printed treasuries, buy bonds and notes that the treasury is going to issue? It's going to have to be the Fed if you want to keep the house of cards up from collapsing. So people, and then if we do see that inflation, right, it's a race to outpace inflation. Are you going to get that from gold, 
Probably not. Are you going to get that from silver? Probably not. It'll preserve the money you have, and you might see, I don't know, 2 to 4% gains a year, but if inflation is 7, 8, 9, 10% a year, you're still losing money every single year. And so what sector, where can you go and make 30, 40, 50% gains in a year? Where are millionaires being made literally every day right now in dumb shit like meme coins? It's the cryptocurrency space. And so I think people are going to turn to things like that. They're going to be like, screw the government, screw the bonds, screw gold and silver. Like, I need to do something for myself. And you look at a sector where you see, you watch, you, you know, you, you go to sleep one morning at a $20 million market cap. You wake up next day, it's a $200 million market cap coin. I mean, where else are you going to find that? And what, but what people don't understand is it, a zero, it is a zero sum game. So at the other end, someone is losing money. But I think when it gets to a point where it's like, I got to support my family. I got to pay my rent. I got to buy food. It's like everyone for themselves. So cool. Come into the crypto space, find some coins, projects, whatever. Make a four to five X in a month, whatever the case may be, especially if the bull market's going. So it's just an intriguing scenario to think about. But if you're sitting there and thinking the dollar is going to remain on top and the U.S. economy is going to chug along for the next 50, 60 years, no bumps in the road, you are truly mistaken, my friends, which is why you want to make sure that you're plugged into different ecosystems different financial instruments to make sure that you're protecting and preserving and making money uh, for the future for not only you, but for your family, wife, and kids as well. Uh, all right, uh, let's jump into the markets here for us, but I want to show you a very important chart. Um, what are your thoughts on this McDonald's pattern here? Are we, are we more downside I'm or? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, look, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, it could break either way. I mean, if you look at the fractal from last time we broke our all-time high, it's actually looking pretty similar here. If we get a bid and make a higher low, um, I'll, I can bring up that fractal in a little while. Um, if, if you're if ready want, now for us, you can you can go ahead, man. Uh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, let me let me share my screen here. Boom! Talk screen sharing. We'll go window entire screen. There we go. All right. Um, and maybe we'll take a peek at the gold and silver chart if uh, people will humor me um, later on or if anyone's interested. It's so bull. I've just never seen. Hey, if you uh, can help us make money, like, man. I'm bullish. down. It's just insanity. Um, all right. So if you look at this, let's go to logarithmic view and uh, you know, bear with me here as I grab this uh, fractal pattern. So this is the last time we, this is from where we broke 20K. Um, and again, like fractals are useful just for seeing like how price action has moved in the past and how it may be moving in a similar scenario now. Um, so, I mean, like it's, it's pretty stunningly similar, right? Um, you know, we basically made, uh, now keep in mind, this was, this was 20 K this was on our way to break 20 K. We made a first attempt, got rejected with a big spill off, right? Big, big spill off. Um, and we made a second attempt. Uh, and I don't worry too much about which one's higher. This is essentially just a double top, right? A double top. And now we're coming back down for, uh, what may be a higher low. And if we make a, lot, a higher low here, and this is where things get a little bit dicey because you still, you, you, we do have the government, you know, with a lot of Bitcoin to sell, but I mean, if people really want to deploy into Bitcoin and they've been waiting for kind of a, a correction and a sell-off and an opportunity and some FUD to deploy, I mean, there's people that are sidelined and funds and institutions that are sidelined with size that may just deploy billions of dollars right into that um, or hundreds of millions of dollars right into that. But essentially what we're looking for is just, you know, um, you know, a, a little you know, trend line here, high or low, similar to what we saw last market cycle. Look, I'm of the opinion where if we come back up and we take out this level, this uh, I is like 72K, 71 and, and change, um, that is an ascending triangle. That is a very bullish pattern. You start taking out that level, it's very, very bullish. And it's very similar to what we saw last market cycle before Bitcoin just took off. So I still remain pretty bullish on Bitcoin here. Um, if we start breaking this trend and we start breaking down here, and then you know th there's a lot of liquidity down here below this kind of like 50.5K level. You know there's a lot of leverage long sitting down here with their liquidation points down here, and it won't be pretty. Honestly, it'll be pretty ugly in my opinion if we do get a flush down to this level because I think you'll get some cascading liquidations. And like this is not a place where I would want to be leveraged. 
uh, on the market just because of the volatility that we're seeing and how much open interest is here. Any flush that we do get is probably going to be, you know, like a V-shaped recovery where you just get a nasty wick down. Um, I've talked to somebody who their bear scenario, their worst case scenario is if we do get, you know, a big flush and, you know, keep in mind, the CME has a ridiculous amount of leverage built up in it right now. If we get a kind of a, a disaster scenario, let's just say, for example, uh, you know, the government just market sells all of that Bitcoin right into the market and nobody comes in to bid uh, immediately. You could flush all the open interest out of the market down to like 50K and then you could get cascading liquidations and a nasty wick down to like 38. I know that sounds crazy and that is not my base case. I personally believe we'll get people deploying into that and I don't necessarily think that they would just market sell it all at once. But the disaster scenario is like, you know, if you see a disaster doomsday wick down to like 38, 40K, then absolutely that is a buy. That is a buy. In the meantime, I'm bullish because we're printing the same pattern that we saw last cycle breaking our all-time high. If we get a, a bid here and we turn around and we make a higher low and then we take out 72K, to me, it's straight up. It's game on. And that is my base case at the moment. Uh, I'll be willing to reassess if we break down below, you know, 64, 63 K, or even we break down below 61. Um, cause I think if we do break down below 60, 61, it'll be a rather quick trip all the way down to 50. And, and then you'll want to be deciding whether or not you bid down here or not. I'll be a bidder. I'll be a bidder at, at 50 and a bidder at 38. If that happens, I don't think that's going to happen. Base case is up from here. Um, but yeah, we are just kind of in, a, in an important pivot point, um, you know, kind of following this fractal. We want to see this zone hold. If it does, very, very, very bullish. If it breaks down, we make a new low. All right. We just got to not be so, uh, you know, we can't sit and be upset. Uh, we just have to, you know, do what the market tells us. It would take what the market gives us and uh, be ready to buy lower. Um, but until that happens, I'm I'm pretty bullish here. I think we're probably going to print an ascending triangle and then and then head higher. Really, the the um, the wild card in the market right now is just that government, you know, 2.1 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin being sent sent to Coinbase. What are they going to do with it? How are they going to sell it? What's going to happen next? We don't really know. And that uncertainty is being reflected in Bitcoin's price right now. Yesterday was a positive inflow day for for the ETF, right? People are still, you know, buying Bitcoin in the ETF. It's just a lot of the speculation is getting like people are deleveraging with good reason. We don't know what Coinbase is going to do or what the government's going to do with that 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 Bitcoin they sent to Coinbase. So why wouldn't you deleverage? I don't want to be leveraged here, just in case. This is not where you want to get caught in some nasty, you know, doomsday wick that bounces right back, but all of a sudden you have no money because you were too leveraged. Uh, I think you know being low leverage or spot here. Um, and being ready for any scenario is is the appropriate measure. It's all about you know not not uh, not going broke in the in the you know the the very low chance that something disastrous does happen in the short term. Because even if it does go down to test this 50k and flush this liquidity down here, which again I want to be clear, I don't think that's going to happen. That's not my base case. But if it does happen, you know, are you ready for that? Can you survive that? Can you be a buyer down here? Right. Because I think it's probably going to go right back up afterwards if that does happen. Um, so that's kind of the way I'm viewing the market right now. I'm, I'm pretty bullish, but um, I'm not leveraged to the point where a, you know, a large flush of all this open interest built up in the market would kill me. Um, I'd be able to, to, to get through it and, uh, and survive for the bounce back. Awesome. Um, I do want to share, um, uh, Forrest. I'm going to go over the markets uh, and I'm going to look at an ETH Bitcoin chart. Do you want to pull up just an ETH US chart, a USDT or US dollar chart while I do that? Sure. And then we'll look at that. So I feel like ETH has kind of been underperforming. It got up to almost 4K. Um, and then we're seeing other alts rise. I think the ETH ecosystem, as far as just from price movement, Polygon under it's been under a dollar, hasn't moved. Uh, Optimism, Arbitrum, I don't remember seeing massive moves from them. Maybe I'm wrong. We take a look at ETH, $3,323, down 4.27% over the last 30 days. While well, you see everything else outside of XRP and Cardano in the top 10, it's, oh, wow, Toncoin in the top 10. Holy shit. Um, wow. I, wow. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Solana, 186 bucks, up 43%. There are some issues on Solana, I saw some stuff on Twitter. People cannot withdraw their Solana from exchanges. Um, the network, uh, there's a lot. Because Solana is so cheap, 
there's a lot of microtransactions happening, which are flooding the network. Um, the, the network hasn't had an outage, but still there's degradation of performance. Um, I'll tell you what though, if I got to resubmit a, a transaction a couple times, two, three times and pay two cents versus it go through on the first try in Ethereum, which by the way, on Ethereum yesterday, uh, three separate times, a transaction failed on ETH when I was trying to swap on Uniswap. So it's not just happening on Solana. It's happening everywhere. A lot of these volumes, a lot of the meme coins, they're driving prices. And um, I don't know, do you, do you have any any um, thoughts on that, Forrest? You know, the the whole Solana FUD, it's not working. It's going down thing, coming back, coming back around. Any Any insight there? Like network outages or just drop transactions? Drop transactions, uh, fail transactions, people not being able to pull their Solana off of exchanges. Um, yeah, so first of all, like I would rather have that. And you guys know, like I've been a big Solana bull for a while. I personally think a lot of this Solana trade has happened. Like the easy money has been made. I think upside from here is cap. Like I do think Solana could go like five, $600, maybe a thousand. I don't know. It depends on the bull market, but like $20 to 200, that's already been a text 10 X. Um, so I think like the market is now like pricing Solana in the realm of where it should. I still think it'll reprice in the long term more towards ETH. So I do think there's, there's a lot of upside there, but you guys know, I've been a Solana bull for a while. As far as like the technology and how it works, like in, in like user experience, I, I would rather have dropped transactions that like, you know, I lose a less than a penny in, a, in, in fees versus, you know, a drop. I've had failed transactions on Ethereum before. Um, it's not ideal. And you lose like $50 in gas fees if gas fees are high. Like that's way, way, way worse in my opinion. I agree. Um, but as far as like, as, as far as just in, in general, um, Solana has a localized fee market. So like if the app allows it, like a lot of apps, a lot of decentralized applications on Solana have not upgraded um, to allow this yet, but some have. You can actually set a priority fee. You can actually increase the amount of Solana you're willing to pay as gas. Uh, to have your transaction go through in front of other people's transactions. You can still get through most of the time with just like your base fee, and which is super, super cheap. But let's just say you're willing to pay like five cents instead of a fraction of a penny. Um, you can like pretty much guarantee that your transaction will always go through. It's just that a lot of uh, exchanges and a lot of decentralized applications have not actually um, programmed that feature into their um, into their um, programs yet or into their protocols yet. So um, we'll see that, you know, come with time, but yeah, you can pay, pay a little extra just like you can on Ethereum now. And uh, you know, I agree with everything you said, you know, like I, like I said, or before you started talking is yesterday I was swapping on Uniswap. I've had, I had multiple failed transactions. And so if it's going to happen where I'd rather lose a penny or $20, the, the answer is quite obvious. Uh, going back to the, the, uh, coin mark cap here, XRP, the stable coin is at 57 cents, uh, Doge at 17.69 cents, still up almost 20% over the last 30 days. Cardano, extremely underperforming and ton coin has entered into the top 10 coming in at 83% over the last, tw uh, 30 days. Let's take a look at the 24 hours. Athena is up. 25.93% big get token flare network, which are today's our today's afternoon upload is going to be on flare and a, uh, an update on that uh, ecosystem, uh, near protocol injective and BSV are up over four and a half percent. Some of the biggest losers, uh, core pendle, Bitcoin cash stacks is down 5.27% over the last seven days, 8.8% over the last 24 hours. Um, and then I do want to take a look at a Ethereum versus Bitcoin chart. Now, this is ETH versus Bitcoin on the daily. We had broken the downtrend, right? This, this yellow trend line you see. We had broken that. Uh, we came back, retested, right? Price reacted positively. We did dip below for a few days, but in a single candle, got right above it. Uh, retested it once. And that is where we are currently trading at right now. Uh, I'm going to hide that and I'm going to throw on these price action concepts here. So we are approaching our discount zone on ETH versus Bitcoin, which is right around 0 0.04845. So which would require, uh, another three and a half percent drawdown of ETH against Bitcoin. Uh, 
Is this a forest? Is this a trade setup that uh, what are your thoughts on this chart? Um, and then um, I'm hoping you have that ETH chart pulled up as well. Is ETH a good play here? Um, is it undervalued or you think, you know, the days of 20, 22, 23% ETH dominance are gone and hey, ETH is, is losing market share and, and hey, price might not get to that 12, 15,000 that we all thought it would. Uh, I mean, that ETH Bitcoin chart right there is pretty, pretty toxic price action, right? I mean, that's look how difficult that is to trade. I mean, it's just nothing but chop. Even if you're trying to trade Bitcoin in favor of a theory, like if you're trying to short ETH Bitcoin, it's like a very difficult chart to short as well. Yeah. Um, so ETH Bitcoin in particular, like the, I just look at that chart and I was like, I can't get a fix on this. I, I can't, I'm not, you know, once it breaks out, once it bottoms out or once it, uh, you know, you know, shows a sign of breaking, you know, downwards from here from kind of that horizontal level. Um, maybe it becomes a little bit more attractive for me to trade, but I am. I, this is a chart that I've avoided for a long time just because of that erratic choppiness of it. Um, very, no clear direction. Like, is Ethereum going to outperform Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin going to continue to outperform Ethereum? Difficult to tell because, like, right now, like the catalyst for Ethereum is an Ethereum ETF. But the likelihood from the analysts, James, uh, James Safer and Eric Valchunas, they're actually like very low likelihood. Yeah on that actually getting uh, passed. And a large part of that is because the SEC has been quiet about it. They're going after the Ethereum foundation. So it's like, if they actually do get an Ethereum ETF through somehow, um, then I think the market is very much mispricing Ethereum and you'll see Ethereum pump because I don't think like the Ethereum ETF is being priced into the market at all. Um, w w especially with the SEC going after, after the Ethereum foundation. I'll share a chart here on uh, that. Not not to say that I'm I'm necessarily like bearish on um, on Ethereum. Like Ethereum just always does this. Like it just lags. But like even last market cycle, uh, it it would just kind of lag and underperform and just kind of slowly grind up and then pop. Um, and then just kind of lag and underperform and then slowly grind up and then pop. And, and we, we're seeing the same thing. You know, we, we've seen the same thing already this market cycle. Um, you know, we saw just everybody was complaining about uh, Ethereum not going up. It just kept getting its rally stuffed back down to this $21, $2,200 level. And all of a sudden, it rallied from $2,200 just nonstop. It, like when Ethereum decides to move, it just does not give you corrections. It is just straight up. And uh, we've seen this in, in like uh, last, last market cycle is just very, very slow, very, very, very choppy, up and down, up and down. And then all of a sudden, it just basically ran straight up with no corrections. Here's another example, just straight up with no corrections. Um, so Ethereum, like, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it is kind of trapped between two narratives right now. And it's that ETH ETF narrative is just kind of weak right now. If if they do get an ETF through, then Unless I think it'll be to very, Robin, very bullish for Ethereum. Robin, Robin still up? thinks Robin still thinks we're getting one in May because his his whole leaning factor is well, BlackRock doesn't get denied. That's his whole thesis. Is because what? BlackRock what? doesn't get denied. And they have an ETH application. Yeah, I, I respect that actually a lot. I, I think there's, 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 you could, that, that's a valid thesis to be long ETH right now is just the fact that BlackRock gets everything through. Um, in, it, it is a really weird situation that's, that's going on um, with, you know, the SEC. It's almost, almost like they want to just find a reason to reject it or delay yeah. it as much as possible. They're posturing like it's going to get rejected, but. Um, yeah, like I'm still bullish on Ethereum. It just, it always does this. It just lags and lags and chops and chops. And then it just moves straight up and gives you no entry until it's at a much higher price. It gets yeah. everybody FOMOing in and uh, then you buy it at the top and and you get punished and, you know, chop for a while. Um, but yeah. So Forrest, ETH dominance is currently at 16.1%. Will we ever see 22, 23% ETH dominance ever again? Ooh, um, no, I, I'm, look, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on a lot of other, a lot of other altcoins stealing dominance from both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like Bitcoin's like the, the sole benefactor, right? Like Bitcoin dominance, in my opinion, is, is really high right now in large part because of its ETF, right? It's the only, it's the only asset, the only crypto asset seeing massive traditional finance inflows from the ETF. Now, if 
other ETFs get approved like Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin and Dogecoin, then I think that could steal some dominance away from, from Bitcoin and Ethereum. If an Ethereum ETF gets approved next, then I think then Ethereum will take some dominance away from Bitcoin and you'll see the ETH Bitcoin ratio go up. Um, but yeah, I think in the long run, um, I, I just think that there's so much being built in this space. So many interesting things. Like I think Solana is going to steal some, uh, Solana already has stolen some dominance. You're going to see other things that are really like real world asset protocol. You're going to see just competition. Like in general, competition is going to just steal dominance from Bitcoin and Ethereum. It doesn't mean, mean that like Bitcoin and ETH are going to like go down in price. Like Bitcoin and ETH could still go up in price and see dominance, you know, get stolen just a little bit by uh, various other things. Um, that you know are, are, are developing and building in the space. I think it's good in this. Like, I think it's good for Bitcoin dominance to eventually go down and uh, let the rest of the not let the rest of the market, but for us to have other things in the market to speculate on that you know to drive a lot of attention and market share. Um, doesn't mean Bitcoin's going to go down. Just means that like, hey, you know, the Bitcoin's not the only game in town. There's other things to actually buy uh, and to speculate on. So, Forrest, um, a year ago today. Solana dominance was at 0.66%. It is currently at 3.26%. ETH dominance in the same time frame has gone from 18.86 to just under 16% dominance. You can see here from the chart, this is the sole one that is uh, highlighted here. So um, I'm in the camp that 22, 23% ETH dominance is a thing of the past. I do think, um, especially once interoperability becomes more practical, and some of these rails are built, whether it's through CCIP, whether it's through what NIR is doing with chain abstraction. Uh, once we're able to have beyond one blockchain, whether it's NIR, whether it's Avalanche, whether it's Solana, and dip into multiple liquidity pools from multiple different layer ones without having to use that actual layer one from a user perspective, um, I think the days of that 24, 25% dominance are gone. I even might go as far as to say, I think the, that 20% could potentially be gone. Um, you know, Rob brought this up yesterday is like, we would have assumed, right? We knew when it went from proof of work to proof of stake, it wasn't really going to change anything on the transaction fees, right? But with the introduction of EIP 4844, I believe that's the number with the, uh, with the uh, protodank sharding and the blob inscriptions, um, even that hit a snag to where the layer twos were also faced with higher fees and nothing has been done to fix the L1. Um, will we get one before the bull market is over? Who knows? But guess what? The next wave of users that are coming in that want to throw hundred bucks at some, they ain't paying $60 for a gas fee. They're not, they're going to go to Solana or they're going to use a bridge or if an infrastructure is built out, let's say from near protocol, you have one address uh, through chain abstraction. You can just, buy whatever you want and it gets reverted back to your near your near address or your near wallet. I think I think that's something that we're going to see more we're going to see more of and it's a shame but I'm like I'm sorry. I'm just not as bullish on Ethereum as as some people are and um yeah. It's my two cents there. Um all right, let's talk about uh dogs. Doggy coin. Dogecoin could hit astronomically high price target if Doge repeats its 2018 through 2021 pattern, says crypto analyst Ali Martinez. He says, quote, I feel my fellow DGENs have been distracted with the new shiny meme coins, but Dogecoin remains the most important altcoin in this sector. From a technical perspective, Doge seems to mirror the 2018 to 2021 pattern. If so, Doge could be at the very beginning of a massive bull run. And this target is... The top end of this, I don't know if you guys can see the gray, $12. Um, I know you're bullish on Doge, and I think the big part of that narrative is an ETF, right? Because it is proof of work. Some argue it's the most decentralized after Bitcoin. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying some people argue that. Doesn't really have a foundation. Doesn't really have a founder. Or well, does have a founder, but doesn't really have someone pulling the strings, essentially. Um, but do you agree that the, the profits from these other meme coins on, let's say Solana or like Bonk or Pepe, whatever, will eventually flow back into Doge? Or do you think the, the, the big util the use case here and the theory of Doge getting to that three to $10 that you brought up 
is strictly from ETF and from outside investment? Yeah, mostly probably from speculative mania and, and uh, ETF and outside investment. And also it's just becomes like we're seeing like this, this idea of a meme coin super cycle where like instead of buying lottery tickets, people are just trying to get rich off of meme coins. It's like understandably so everyone's struggling and like people are hitting the jackpot you know, left and right. And it feels like everybody's winning but you. But in reality, like most people are losing and like just one rent. You only see the people that win big. Um, yeah, I, I think there's going to be. First of all, like like I said, like and I got made fun of for saying this, and then all of a sudden, Coinbase derivatives LLC files for with the CFTC for yep. uh, futures trading for yep. Doge, Litecoin, and and Bitcoin Cash, and then all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Oh, Doge could get an ETF from this." Um, I think Doge is going to get an ETF. I think it makes the most logical sense for for Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Dogecoin to get ETFs because they're the most similar to Bitcoin, which has already gotten one. Um, and I think Doge has potentially as much upside as I do believe that Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin have from ETFs, which again is a pretty unpopular opinion. Like a lot of people just hate Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash because they didn't make all-time highs last cycle. They were pretty irrelevant last cycle. Um, but if they get ETFs, I think all of a sudden they'll be very, very relevant again. And you'll see a lot of TradFi money flow into them because I don't think they really care about uh, specifics and DeFi and, you know, learn. they just want crypto exposure. Um, I think Dogecoin's the most interesting because you have this whole idea of a meme coin super cycle. And in comparison to Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin, Dogecoin has the largest market cap, the most liquidity that you can move into with size. There's no other meme coins besides maybe Shiba Inu. And, um, you know, there's some smaller ones out there. But if you're trying to move 30, 40 million dollars into a, a huge position into one of these uh, meme coins, like Dogecoin and Shiba Inu are like basically the only ones that you can move into and Dogecoin's the most likely to get an ETF. And you also have the idea of like this meme coin super cycle or all this popularity in meme coins. You're probably like like institutional investors, larger funds, these bigger players that want to come in and and speculate and get get exposure to the idea of a meme coin super cycle. They can really only move size into Dogecoin. Dogecoin becomes kind of the the Bitcoin of meme coins. Um, of, you know, like, all right, big players can actually come and play and get exposure to the meme coin narrative through Dogecoin and they can do it with size and they can do it through an ETF potentially if one gets passed later on down the road. Um, yeah, I threw out the target. The my, my, my targets for Dogecoin are very, very high. I think three to $10. Obviously that assumes like we're seeing a full bull market cycle out of crypto. If this bull market cycle out of crypto gets neutered, Bitcoin doesn't break 100K, then yeah, that $3 to $10 to Dogecoin is probably not going to happen. If we go over 100k Bitcoin and we get a full crypto market cycle, like I think we're going to, then yeah, three to ten dollars. And I know it sounds crazy, but um, that institutional money, um, those ETFs, uh, very, very, very large potential catalysts for for um, for, for Dogecoin, in my opinion. Uh, Forrest, I am looking up inverse Kramer ETF volume. Just curious because you know you've compared it to that, um, and. I'm just trying to. It's very low. Okay. Yeah, the inverse Kramer ETF I think is getting shut down. But mm. that comparison, like, I don't think there's a lot of narrative or people that really want to speculate on cra fading uh, Jim Kramer. That's just to throw out the idea of like, oh, people think like ETFs have to be super serious, and right. that's because we just went through this entire Bitcoin. Uh, ETF narrative where it's like it went through so many checks and balances and took forever to get past. But like now that we're through that for Bitcoin, the same due diligence doesn't have to necessarily be done for for Dogecoin because it's the same technology essentially. Um, that was just to show and demonstrate that look, ETFs don't have to be extremely serious. Like the idea of a meme coin stock ETF, there's one out there, or right. a meme ETF is completely feasible and and they get passed. Amen to that. I, I, I agree with you. I don't know about three to ten dollars, um, but I could definitely see a Doge ETF happen. Um, will it happen before an Ethereum one? I think Rob uh, brought up a really good point is, hey, you need to see this thing on the CME first as a future is which to your point, Coinbase already applied for one. Um, and so it's interesting to keep an eye on Doge currently is sitting at, uh, I think, 17 cents. Right or seventeen point nine cents. So 17. if it does 5. get to the lower end of that three dollars, um, 
you're looking at a what is that a, almost a 20x almost a 20x or a little less than a 20x yeah the three bucks so i mean yep. from a number eight crypto project one that's been around for a very long time right well 11 years is the og meme coin um has a lot of things going for it. it's got you know it's got the whole elon musting and twitter and payments and uh it's interesting to at least uh to put on your watch list or to maybe get some exposure to if it if this thing does run it does get an etf you know these meme coin profits from these other memes start to pile into doge you know it'll be nice to uh have a little position on that uh all right guys i would like to recommend that all of you go follow this man on your screen here uh sistine research on x slash twitter uh here is the page and the handle at sistine research on x and um i think we can drop that in the comments oh and he's uh force has a youtube channel as well but i believe he's a little more active on x and force you can feel free to correct me if i'm wrong um but also if you want some insight into some projects or or what force really has his eye on uh, we know he's hit a lot of big, uh, big plays from his research hub. Uh, I personally made a lot of money with it, and a lot of people in our community have as well. Uh, we do have an affiliate link in the description of that video as well. And I believe uh, if you use a certain coupon code on there, you will, uh, Forrest is kind enough to give you guys a little bit of a discount. So big shout out to you, Forrest. Um, also, go follow us on X slash Twitter. Are you still saying Twitter or are you saying X? I'm trying my best to say X. I say Twitter. I say Twitter. I just, I don't know. I can't get out of the habit. Exactly. I think he never should have changed the I name. I agree. I agree. I 100% agree. Um, all right. Also, our Flare Token video drops uh, in about 10 minutes. If you're a member of this channel, you do get access first before the public does. Um, and then it goes live to the public around 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and with that being said, anyone else? All good. Gravy Train, Rocco? Great. Is that a dog with hat? Yes, it is. <laughs> you. You're a little late to the party, man. Four billion market cap. You didn't buy any, did you? Who say I didn't buy? Oh, okay. okay. Got you you hiding drop. some big gains back there, or what? Okay. The Italians they don't speak very quiet. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uncle Sam is listening. Tornado. <laughs> Uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to come back tomorrow. We're going to have Forrest on again. It's going to be an absolutely amazing show. On behalf of all of us here at Sin City Crypto, love you guys. Until tomorrow. Peace. Sin City Crypto. Everybody know we here, for Entertainment and info. Going to show you how to get that big dough. So every day stay tapped in. For big facts, no cap in. With Bitcoin, if you're in, then you win. We divide the pie with no fraction. It's Big Rob, David. I split the game, but they gave it. Name the coin that's your favorite. I got dry powder, why save it? To the O. OGs, new beginners, special shout out to the well members, buy dip, sell winners, ain't really nothing you can tell sinners, tune in for the latest new flavors, they gonna teach us mean coins, they polarizing like barbecue chicken pizzas, I laugh with a major grin, lag as we trade them in, baddies they came to sin, and sinners gon' play to win, screaming hola, till my bags are flowing over, hold ya, to the moon and to the solar, won't I, don't be letting FOMO 